southwest swell. I meet Mark Jenkin in the Zen room of the Newlin Film House early in the evening, Monday, the 15th of April, before a screening of Big Wednesday, which Mark has picked. Mark and I have known each other for over 20 years and become friends in the last 15 years or so. It feels apt to mention this because Big Wednesday is a film about friendship and it's about friendship across time. At least that's how it seemed to me, having rewatched it for the first time in over 30 years with a packed audience at the film house. Mark and I ate some chips and had a chat and we talked about the podcast and we talked about signed sound lists and we talked about Big Wednesday and we talked about John Milius and we talked about filmmaking before we headed into the screening which we introduced. Yeah, I'm recording you. (laughs) (laughs) Open with that. That's it. Um, I'll never come back. So is... Did Derek, is Dario, um, he's back to the new season, is he? He'll be back next season. Uh, the recharge his batteries. Yeah, just the way he pitched it to me was like he likes doing it. And similar to when I took a break, it was don't want to not enjoy doing it. Yeah. And when it becomes a job. job. Yeah. And it was, sometimes it's just, it doesn't, it's not as enjoyable as it should be. No. So if you've got your deadlines, inevitably it ends up. In a yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and just life gets in the way. So, yeah. Um, yeah, he's just sort of taking a bit of a... Yeah, just stepping back from it for the season. Yeah, um, but yeah sh- he should be back, all being well, for the new one. Um, yeah, I think there's already stuff... Is it already stuff I've got lined up for that, I think? Yeah, I think we're already talking about some stuff for, for you know, for, for when he's back, So, which is nice. Do you actually have a break, or do you go, right, now this is the next season? No, no, we always break in the summer, so All right. um, usually usually July and August we're off, and then we start again in September, right. and then we usually take January off as well. Yeah. So we have like the Christmas one and then come back in Feb, which is what we're what having this year. Um, oh yeah, we always take a break. So this one will, will go through to the summer? This this season will, yeah. So he won't be back until September? No, he'll be back in September. All ah, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So although, depending on when this goes out, he may have already been back for a... Because remember, I, when I, I did the sight and sound one on my break. The, what, the 10? Yeah, yeah. The, what's, when was that? Because I'm going to say about that in my intro. Late 2022, that was. That it was published. Yeah, it came out like December the 1st or something, 2022. Yeah. It's weird, isn't it? Because I always thought it was on the... I guess I, I, I always thought it was on the 10. It's, no, it's on the 2. Yeah. Um, yeah. 2002, 2012, 2022. Um, and because I'd voted in that before, and then we got, you know, as we voted on it obviously earlier, because as you know, yeah. and then we were sort of contracted, not contracted, but, you know, we agreed to do it with them in the summer, you know, as part of the, um, that was really thrilling actually, because we saw the list before anyone, you know, when we recorded the episode, we got the list early. Yeah. Because... Obviously, we needed to record the episode. Thank you. Uh, so much, and a ketchup. That's us, yeah. Um, yeah. Can I get you anything else, please? No. Good. Rings good for me. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. She's passing the mayo. Euphemism intended. <laughs> um, yeah, so, like, because obviously we needed to see it in order to talk about it. Yeah. Because our episode dropped literally on the, like the 7 p.m. that it was announced it was announced in the nfc one wasn't it it was yeah were you there for that dario was for a, um which he talks a little bit about in the episode i think um no he can't because we recorded it before we talked about it maybe on a bonus um he said that was an interesting experience um you know because it's a lot of people there who weren't not or who weren't voters you know yeah um including i think was it Elena Gorfinkel who wrote the against list piece for another gaze? I think it was Elena Gorfinkel. Moment, it's not her. But the another whoever wrote the other uh, the against list piece in another gaze, which came out sort of three or four years before, wrote right. anti this kind of ranking of art. And it's a really interesting piece and very compelling in many ways. Um, 
so there was that kind of presence in the room, which was really interesting in terms of this big announcement. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it was the announcement of um, Jean Dielman, which kind of just threw everyone for a, a loop, really. You know, no one had kind of expected it. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so I came back for that one. He's, and then, yeah, like I say, depending on when this is. Because I programmed the Ennis Lang DNA yeah. season and chose Jan Dillman because lots of people had said that I was obviously influenced by it. Yeah. With Ennis Lang. You look like a prophet. Well, yeah. Yeah. But I thought it was going to be amazing because there's going to be a chance in NFT1 to see Jan Dillman. Nobody's nobody ever gets a chance to see on the big screen, and then it was announced as the back is from full time. And you just couldn't move for screens or it <laughs> everywhere. But that was crazy. I went I, and then I, was, I I went to London to introduce my screening because I saw right, I'm going to make my screen stand out. I'll go and introduce it. It was on a Saturday afternoon, on a really lovely, fun, a really like nice sunny Saturday. Hey, January, but you know a rare nice day I was like there's no way there's going to be anybody there and it was completely sold out yeah but that was the power of it wasn't it like yeah. and that's the that's the that's the thing of one of the powers of those lists is it can do that it can get people to you know it's interesting because like I see it I see often see lists now as ways of combating just kind of choice fatigue like there's just so much choice so it's like okay well this you know checking stuff out in kind of good faith and it drove a lot of people to that film and other films that yeah wasn't even on their radar yeah. that's, a, that's a good thing and a lot of people you know everybody had an opinion about that film didn't they hmm. even people who haven't seen it yeah yeah <laughs> they were the loudest mm -hmm. um, <laughs> so we had you were last I was thinking about this which probably was Big Wednesday on your 10 yeah yeah I thought it was Cause, yeah, because the last time you were on was for Radio On. Yeah. Which was also on your ten. Yeah. Yeah. And there's a link between the two. What's the link? Finish chip. Is it this, so? We, might this go out? Oh, we're talking about now. I think so. I'll just see how we get on. To it, so it sounds like with it. The link between the chops. Chris Bassett and his time out, he, he reviewed Big Wednesday and Time Out. My right, folk. I'll make sure I'm going to read out his quote in my intro. So we're currently working our way through your top 10 yeah. episodes on the, on the sort of still is. Yeah, I did think when I was preparing for this, I thought it quite, um, well, I mean, see how it goes. My yeah, it's a disaster, but I thought, huh, quite happily just do this once a month, once a week. It makes you really study a film and really, um, you know, really, this is what I'm going to put, so vouch for its value. Hmm. Because I think some people watch this film and say, it's, you know, why not, why, why do I think it's so great? And it is so subjective, because yeah. it's all linked to my childhood and stuff. But also, it's quite, he's quite divisive, John Williams. If anybody's, you know, still talking about him he's one of those directors who I think people have sort of forgotten about and he did some incredible things yeah yeah as a screenwriter and as a director as a, yeah yeah but not only is he kind of not talked about anymore I think if he was talked about he'd be kind of cancelled yeah it was interesting because two things there I'm, at the weekend I saw a mutual pal Ollie Berry right and that was the question he asked he's like I don't know I don't know what Mark sees in this film <laughs> um, and also I put it out to staff to colleagues at, at Falmouth about the event and Jane Pugh who I think you know as well yeah. got back and was like sounds great but I can't do it because of Milius you know oh really yeah which was an interesting you know again because of his kind of the military stuff with Milius that is what she can't get past which I thought was interesting but yeah it's 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 a really interesting choice in many ways so yeah why well I think it's the film that I've watched the most ever 
Um, that and this in Ghostbusters. <laughs> But but next month, Ghostbusters. Yeah. Yeah. But I think Ghostbusters, I've watched. I've probably seen both films a hundred times, but I think I've probably watched Ghostbusters a hundred times in that, the year that it came out on video. Yeah. And I haven't watched it a lot since. But Big Wednesday, I've watched. I must have seen it a hundred times in my probably 40 years since I first saw it. Well, that, I don't know. I think, yeah, I, think I probably saw it when I was about nine or ten. When it was first out of VHS, I think it came out of VHS in like 84, 85. Mm, I don't know, yeah, I wouldn't have seen it. Well, I didn't see it till later, but yeah. But it must have, because it's what's, yeah. But I saw it at an age when... Um, I didn't know that in terms of surfing parlance, I didn't, I didn't know why a Malibu board was called a Malibu. Yeah, if I didn't know it was a place called Malibu. Um, I'd probably seen Malibu in it. In the Brinks cabinet. In 1984, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not my drink cabinet. <laughs> I did I did It never crossed my mind that it wasn't set in Cornwall. Interesting, okay. So it, it just seemed to be, because I grew up on the, on the north coast of Cornwall, it was at a friend of mine's house um, where I used to go and stay behind the hotel near Poles S., which then became an old people's home. And I think probably when it was still a hotel, we used, I used to go over and stay when I was like eight or nine years old and I'd stay in these chalets around the back of this little hotel. And there used to be, people used to come and stay. They were surfers. And I think they were like a lot of mates of his older brother. But I just remember one time that somebody turned up and they had a VHS tape for this film, Big Wednesday. And we all watched it. And I, I just, that was, that was the world. Of, yeah. I just thought it was an old film about Cornwall. Yeah. Because that little bit of Cornwall was my, my universe anyway. Yeah, it didn't cross my mind that it was set somewhere else. Because it seemed so familiar. Um, and even then it was a period film, obviously, because, it, it, you know, that was watching it. Probably it was made in. It came out in seventy eight. So say if I've watched it in eighty five, it was already seven years old. Yeah, which seems nuts. It was only seven years old. <laughs> but then it's set. It's set in the early sixties. Yeah, starts in the early sixties. So when it was met, when it was shot in seventy seven and released in seventy eight, it was already a period film. Yeah. So I think that distanced it. Distanced it from me recognizing that it was kind of in a foreign country because it was already in a foreign time. Yeah. So it wasn't that I saw, you know, they were all Cornish or whatever. I just, thought, I just kind of didn't, it didn't cross my mind that this was set somewhere else. Yeah. It just seemed so familiar. And I think it's that familiarity that's always stayed with me. And wherever you go, where you sort of meet other surfers, it's the sort of touchstone yeah. films. The one, yeah, it's like, it's like Quadrophenia for mods. It's the same thing. But in the same way that Quadrophenia isn't really a film about mods, it's about friendship and coming of age mm. Big Wes does exactly the same thing so it's, it's, it's a surf movie but it's, but it's not really about surfing no because they're subcultures aren't they in that sense you know they attract people who gravitate towards not just the activity but yeah the community yeah when you see it now you know I remember living in London when I lived there for a couple of years in the round 2000 I remember at a Quicks, Quicksilver shot ho opening in Covent Garden and it was like the most hilarious thing to think that there was a, a surf shop in Covent Garden. Yeah. And now it's everywhere. Yeah, yeah. You know, and commercialisation happened a, a lot earlier than the year 2000. Yeah, yeah. It just it got more and more and, that, and I think, yeah, when Milius was making the film in 78, he was lamenting a lost time mm. that was 15 years before or 20 years before, before before they put the highway, the freeway down the coast through Malibu, yeah. when it was all fields up to the beach, and they had the waves to themselves. So it's all, you're always sort of lamenting something, and I think that does, if there's a strong, if there's a strong authenticity to it, you don't have to be part of that subculture no. to recognise the value of it. Yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah. So what's your connection to Serpent then? Well, 
I grew up on the coast round near Poles Est from the north coast, so just grew up round the sea and surfed when I was young. Yeah. Up until up until I went away to London, I suppose. I went to I went to college in Bournemouth and I surfed in Bournemouth because you can surf there's a couple of breaks around there. Um and then when I went to London I didn't surf. Despite that being a quick silver shop in College Garden. <laughs> I surfed and moved away from it, and then I moved back over to Cornwall and didn't. I surfed a little bit when I moved back, but I just don't know. I just, I just, I kind of lost the, yeah, I lost interest yeah. in it really, or the com- compulsion to do it. I was doing other stuff, but the culture is still, still a, a big part of me. And now living down in West Hall, you know, it's, well, everywhere in Cornwall, there's there's a, a surf culture, and there's there's the there's sort of there's the genuine surf culture, yeah, um, and then there's the affected commercial bit, um, and I think quite often the two get conflated, and so surfing sometimes I've been as a bit of a a problematic image, yeah, because there's a brand attached to it now, yeah, 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 it's really problematic, and it's a it's interesting to listen to Willis talk about it because he said you know the it's all for was a bit kind of surfer dude hippy diffy kind of thing. If you talk about the Milius, listen to Milius talk about it and what it was like in on the you know on on the west coast of America that the surfers were well, they didn't like the hippies. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know when the when the hippie thing came in, um, a lot of them found it. You know, a lot of these were kind of working class kids who mm. who would without meaning to sound. Tell life like they'd be. No. We're getting enlightenment through surfing and perfecting uh, what they were doing, you know, and basically studying what they were doing and practicing what they were doing and living what they were doing and, and achieving something through dedication to it. And what Millie says was not surf to take the hippies because the hippies thought that everything could be solved with taking drugs yeah. and everything was kind of free. And without consequence, when actually that annoyed a lot of people, you know, yeah. there are consequences to your actions, which is basically what Big Wednesday is about. You know, everything has consequences. It's yeah, beautifully structured in that way. You keep all of these actions have these consequences that they're coming. That... So, uh, sorry, sorry, it sounds like you're recording. We are, yeah, it's, it's, it's very informal. We're in <laughs> chips. <laughs> exactly. You want to say something before the show? <laughs> Neil will do an intro to the podcast, kind of what's going on, and then he'll introduce me, then I'll introduce the film. Won't be long, though. Yeah, so we'll, we'll be watching you, and just as soon as you stop and go sit down. Cool. Amazing. Yeah, and it's interesting hearing you talk about it in terms of, like, the class element, which, again, just make, you know, makes me think of subcultures and particularly mods, you know, very kind of, you know, and that, like you say, that kind of dedication, and that's, that that um, probably is why, or one of the reasons why the film sort of sits slightly adjacent to a lot of the '70s stuff, because it's not countercultural in the way that a lot of those '70s films are kind of broadly countercultural. Even though under the surface, a lot of them are not as simple as that. But Milius is not a countercultural figure, you know. But surfing is seen as a countercultural thing, like you say. But there is a tension in there, which I wasn't really aware of. Um, because like not being familiar with surfing, um, but it's interesting to hear it like that. Um, Emilius as a figure is kind of lumped in Mm. because he worked with Lucas and he worked with Coppola, but again, never felt like he was of a piece with no. And he got lumped in in with them, and I think he was different, yeah, to them. He's he's kind of you know, he's a bit of an anomaly because he's a sort of right wing Mm. figure from that, that era, but it also feels like a film that is from that era of discovering it on home video, you know, where, like you say, you saw it in North Cornwall yeah. in the in the late 80s. Yeah. And it was, you know, it travelled through communities, which are those communities wouldn't necessarily have seen it if it was a flop, because in those days things didn't didn't open wide necessarily. You know, no, they were just starting to. Yeah, so, have come, I don't doubt if it would have come to the Wade Bridge Regal. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. If it but also, it was, it was the context. So I think I was, I was probably at my mate's place and, you know, in, Suddenly, there was this VHS tape mm. that was in one of the chalets, and it was this film that you had to see. Yeah. So you go in there, going, "Oh my god, this is 
this is important. This yeah. this feels significant. And you could imagine that happening all over the world, really, where there's those communities. Yeah, finding that that kind of film for them yeah. in that period. Yeah. And I'm, yeah, because I think I think that's probably maybe what's held it back is that it's still seen as a surfing film. Yeah, so it still has a barrier to audiences. Yeah. Um, and it's interesting because tonight's screening is sold out. Mm. Um, it sold out really quickly. Yeah. And I'm just wondering who's who's coming and yeah. why. Do you know what I mean? I think that's. A, I'm, I'm interested. Well, I've heard that for Alistair, who just came in to chat to us then. It's all right. Go, come on in. Can I get you anything else? Are you all like fair? Do you want some water or anything? Um, yeah, some water. Water would be great. Thank you. Yeah, cheers. <clears throat> yeah, I said to Alistair, what, you know, when it went sold out, I said, was it, I said, will it be, it might be a mix of like cineasts and surfers, might yeah. be a, a mix, you know, and and maybe some crossover. Yeah. And he, and he said, oh, I didn't get a sense it was surfers. And so he's like, yeah. But then, you know, maybe you don't recognise a surfer on the telephone. <laughs> Vietnam just hands heavy over the whole film and it's used as a device to show these kids having to grow up really quickly, you know, and as the cliche goes, the, the country growing up yeah, yeah. very quickly. Um and also there, so there you've got a really interesting link to some Emilius, another Emilius film, or a film that Emilius had a, a hand in that everybody knows about, which is Apocalypse Now. Yeah, yeah. Which shares characters with Big Wednesday. It might, well, I know, it's great that we've put Big Wednesday on because I've, ne- I've never seen it on the big screen before, and it's great that we're doing this. I'd always joked that I'd love to do a double bill of Big Wednesday and Apocalypse Now, where you play Big Wednesday up until when. Jack and Waxer leave for Vietnam. Yeah. Then you play Apocalypse Now in its entirety, and then you play the final third that Big Wen's his attention to detail is spot on. And in, you know, most of the stories in there are things that happened. Happened to him or his or his friends and and so yeah, I think it is amazing that he got that made because it's such a deeply personal film. Yeah. That's that sort of depresses me a little bit that it did flop because I always think the more personal you make it, the more universal it's going to be. But but maybe maybe it was just expectations. Maybe it was the the hype around it, the build up to it, was yeah. just not what the film was ever going to be. And if he had more control over what the hype and the, and the marketing or you know or the perception or the, the sort of preconceptions about it, it would have been more successful. Yeah. Sounds like, you, like interesting. You talk about the things about his directing and writing because it sounds like quite a kinship there. For you, that's how you like to work, isn't it? In terms of like script words and you know, like thinking about the shots Whoa. and it, you know, in your head. But also, what's the least amount to do the thing? Yeah, well, it's such a it's so complicated to make a film. Such a such a complicated thing to do in order to bring all these elements together and then. You know, you write it, which in one way, you know, people write things and go, that's the finished thing. You know, you write a novel and go, there is the the, the work of art. For, you know, there is the object, there's the thing finished. But with filmmaker, you do that, and then you've got to go, right, now we're going to make it again, but we're going to bring in all of these, maybe hundreds of people, and um, we're going to shoot it, and the shoot will be a nightmare, like every time, just because it won't, it won't be what you've already written, and then we'll go into post production and we'll either try and save it or we'll turn it into something else. And so all of that process is such a crazy thing to do. And nine times out of ten, it doesn't work. You know, nine times as in nobody even gets to the end. Most scripts don't get made into films. Mm-hmm. And then most films that get made, they'll get a good release. Um, yeah, and. Uh, and so I think if that's so complicated, the odds are so stacked against you in the first place, then simplify all the bits you can simplify. You know, so try and this bit I mean, writing for me, I I I think I think um Danny Artwork said the way that Midius writes is he, he doesn't doesn't put many adjectives in, you know, and he takes everything out, which I'm I'm a firm believer in it. And I do it because I don't want to tell my collaborators 
specifically the actors, how characters are feeling. Mm. Yeah. Because I want the actors to give me that. Because I write the script and everybody in the script, every character in the script is just a version of me. And if they just remain a version of me, it's going to be, they're going to be boring characters. They're not going to have any contradictions within them. Um, what the actors do, they come in and they can, their take on it conflicts with my take on it and you get complex characters. So I think that's, you know, that's, that's where I really, I feel the same with, with have, how we worked when it comes to writing. And then when it comes yeah. to directing, it's the same. It's that, you know, even more important in the, in the directing of the film, and I don't mean just like in the language of communication to make it simple, although that is very important, but it's in the, the visual language of filmmaking. You know, if you've got a scene that, and you've thought, I'm going to do this in seven shots, before you start shooting, you think, can I do it in six? And if you can do it in six, ask yourself if you can do it in five. Do you need that tracking shot? Could you do that in two mm. statics? Um, and what it does is the more you've simplified in terms of less shots, the more you have to do with each shot. Yeah. So if you've got lots of shots, this is very simplistic. If you've got lots of shots, then you kind of think, it's, it's like qu a quantity over quality. Yeah, yeah, I've got 17 shots in this scene. And then you hope that these 17 shots that are saying very little individually do add up and say more than the sum of their parts. But sometimes they don't. And sometimes it's just 17 shots that you, you were very proud on the day because you went, oh, we did 17 setups in that day. Yeah. But actually, if you'd thought about it and gone, right, we're just going to take half an hour just to re-block, to block this and think, can we do this in five shots? And then each of those five shots is saying much more on, on their own. Then uh, that's, that's where films kind of, that's, that's where my interest is. Yeah. Well, that's where cinema is, isn't it? In terms of like, it's not. It becomes not about information. You, you get a lot of information in seventeen shots. Yeah. But is the information what you're trying to convey, mm. or is it something else? And are you giving the audience enough room to let them in? Yeah, yeah. So some scenes you don't. If there's an action scene, you go bang, 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 and you, and you chop around yeah, yeah. because you don't want the audience. You want the audience to be on a roller coaster, and not to have any thoughts other than I hope I survive this. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, yeah the psycho shower scene wouldn't work in five shots. <laughs> no. It feeds a lot of shots. Yeah, and then none of those shots work on their own, no, in, individually. But there's certain times when there's just a beautiful scene. I think of the director's commentary. Millis talks about it once. So there's a graveyard scene where they're all sat around the graveyard at night, and he talks about you know less and less shots, and suddenly realises while he's telling the story, and it's called to be looking at his shots, going, "God, yeah." Guess the the sound of the film is obviously turning down. Yeah. So you're looking at just the visuals rather than the dialogue. I said, God, yeah, that shot's doing loads. That shot that I remember for the amazing dialogue, the dialogue's been taken out, and um, it's still amazing. So it was never about the dialogue. Yeah, yeah. The dialogue was the icing on the, on the top. Yeah, yeah. But actually, what I'm looking at, which is this guy who's who's talking, and he's saying one thing, and I know what he's saying, because I know all the dialogue of the film. But when you take dialogue out, you go, oh, my God, his eyes are saying something else. Yeah, yeah. And his eyes, what his eyes <clears> are saying is relating to what's behind him that I never consciously noticed is there, but now there's no dialogue I can see. And you go, that's the, that's, I'm just noticed that. I've just consciously just noticed. Yeah, yeah. I probably recognised that when I was nine years old when I first saw it on some level. And that's just brilliant filmmaking, which is why I think this is a classic that gets dismissed as a circular. Yeah. Good ending. Well, let's see what we did there. He came in for a good landing. Very desperate for a week. <laughs> in screen one at the film house, kind of nervously. Uh, it was a big crowd. It's the first time I introduced a live screening for the podcast in a long time. And uh, Mark was nervous about just screening one of his favorite films in his local cinema for such a big crowd and not knowing whether that crowd was made up of surfers or cinephiles or both, or just anyone. And it was lovely to be back in the room with fellow film lovers and a lot of big Wednesday ones.
Uh, good evening and welcome to Newland Film House for this very special screening of Big Wednesday, as uh, which we're recording for the Cinematologist podcast. My name is Neil Fox, one of the hosts of the Cinematologists, uh, which is a, a film podcast we've been running since 2015. Um, and this is an interesting screening because Mark, who is co-hosting the screen tonight, has co-hosted a number of screenings uh, on the podcast. Uh, but this is the first one that he's picked. So all the pressure tonight is on him uh, to make this a good event, which is already feeling keenly anyway. Um, at the start of the year, uh, we were just chatting and um, I told him that this season of the podcast I was doing on my own because my co-host uh, Dario is taking a break. Um, and we just sort of con conjured up doing a screening here where we've done some, some really great screenings across the years. Um, and Mark just said he really wanted to screen this film. So uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be back here in New Lynn with a sold out audience uh, for this film. Um, but I'll hand over to Mark for a bit more of, a, of an intro to the very special screen tonight. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, everybody, for coming out tonight on a Monday night. I've realised actually that we should, probably should have done this on a Wednesday. <laughs> I've just been calling it Big Monday for the past week. Right. But if people listening on the podcast, if it's not a Wednesday, maybe just pause it and wait, wait till Wednesday. Um, yeah, this is, this is one of my all time favorite films. 20 in 2022, I was asked by the sight and sound magazine to, by the BFI to contribute my 10 greatest films of all time for their poll. And I spent a couple of weeks coming up with a list of 10 films. And then when I'd got the 10, I showed them to Mary, my partner, and she read the list and she said, where's big Wednesday? And I thought, it, had, it wasn't that I hadn't, that I'd forgotten Big Wednesday. I just thought, well, I can't put Big Wednesday on there. It's not one of the greatest films because I was, you know, putting minimalist European black and white, 18 hour long studies of existential nothingness on there because I thought that was what you were supposed to do. But anyway, I bumped one of those films off and put Big Wednesday on. But it really made me kind of reconsider what it is that I love about Big Wednesday, which I won't say now, because we'll, we'll talk about it afterwards. Um, but it's gonna, I've got two quotes. One is from Chris Pettit, who's a, a brilliant filmmaker who made the film um, Radio One, which is one of the greatest British films of all time. When he was writing for Time Out, he described this as one of the best American films of the 1970s. And considering what a massive flop it was at the time, it's quite a, quite a thing to say back then. Has any, who's seen the film? All right, that must be like, for the sake of the podcast, that's about 70%? Yeah. 70%. But you were going to ask, how many, who's seen it over 100 times? Because everyone coming in said, I've seen it at least 100 times. I speak. I've already seen it once today. <laughs> <laughs> I have. Yeah. I watched it this afternoon. Um, yeah. Um, so we'll talk afterwards. I won't say too much now. Just to say anybody who um, kind of sings along with the dialogue will be escorted out joke um and i'm just going to leave one quote um that we've got from uh quentin tarantino who said big wednesday surfers don't deserve this movie <laughs> we'll see you afterwards thank you stayed and we had a really warm and engaging conversation which took in the passing of time and how they filmed all of that amazing surf footage Vietnam and quite controversially the ending of the film
All right. Thank you so much. Uh, thanks for staying. Uh, I'm really excited to hear what what people thought uh, of of the screening. Um, do you want to kick us off? Because you you've seen it over a hundred times, but this is your first time on the big screen. Yes. Which was uh, this is only the second time I've seen it communally. I mm-hmm. programmed it at End of the Road Festival last year, uh, but it was it wasn't on a big screen. It was in a it was in a marquee, um, but that was the first time I'd seen it communally, and it was really emotional yeah. watching it communally. Totally different to to the ways I the you know the previous ninety eight times I'd seen it. This and and. Um, I have seen, that's the second time I've seen it today. That's genuinely the second time I've seen it today. I noticed two new things. The, this afternoon I noticed that for the first time that the score at times sounds a bit like White Christmas. Okay. Do you notice that? No. Right. I've only, that's only the second time I've seen it. Yeah. That's true. So, yeah. Um, which seemed incongruous today that it, yeah. it was a Christmas theme. Um, and then visually I noticed something which is you know, appropriate because it's the first time I've seen it this big, is that, and this links to my sort of argument that, you know, I, I, the slightly provocative Quentin Tarantino quote that I Mm. ended the intro with, and the reason why I didn't initially select this film for my top 10 greatest films of all time is because it gets dismissed as a, as a surfing film. That's not a problem because, there's there's great there's not many but there are some great surfing films and this is this is the greatest but it's such it's much bigger than that and what i noticed today was this mirroring between the beginning and the end where matt johnson our hero opens the film by arriving on the beach with no surfboard and he ends the film with no surfboard and it's kind of like a little i think it's a little a bit of subtext that this is a a bigger film than just about a surfing subculture. Yeah. That was my takeaway. Nice. Yeah. And I then noticed it all nice mirroring at the end. Yeah. I think, so I... Well done. Thanks. <laughs> I've, I've studied film. Um, so I, I, that was the second time I've seen it. Um, with a 30 year gap. With a 30 year gap. And it was really, I mean, it was really moving because it's not, like I'm not a surfer. Um, and I grew up in Luton and when I saw it I was probably about 16 in Luton and my experience of the sea was limited Um, but you know I was I had that group of friends at the time you know like the formative friends Um, and it was all around film and it was all around music at the time and to see it 30 years on and to think of that period of time which the film so beautifully portrays a period of time for a group of friends and how time shifts and i was like this is not a film about surf this is a film about well it's about many things but it's a film about friendship particularly male friendship i think but certainly certainly friendship and time so it was really moving to and having lived here now for yeah sort of you know 11 years and watching it with a different appreciation of the sea and of filmmaking and just thinking what an what a beautiful film it is to look at but also what an achievement um to 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 not just document that natural phenomena but to to invest such a a narrative in it i think is kind of extraordinary yeah and it's such i I think that's right that i because i recognize my friends Mm. and we did sort of grow up around the beach and i think people do recognize the archetypes within the group of friends and i think you put you know i you probably see yourself as one of the group and you probably aren't the one you think you are. Yeah. yeah. Um, and also just what uh, is such a tiny piece of growing up because mm. it starts, uh, you know, in 62. And then when he goes to see Liquid Dreams yeah. and, he get, and, it's, and they have the section on the old timers, mm. he's like 26 yeah. at that point. <laughs> and it's kind of... It's that tragedy of like the fallen gods, mm. that little. I think Millie has said before. It's like the, it's the narrative of every high school yeah. American footballer. He's yeah. the hero, and is destined for great things. Mm. Um, and then they end up living ordinary lives, which is no 
tragedy in that, you know, great joy in in where he sort of ends up. But it's just such a, you know, that's the, just the beginning of his adult life, really, and all of the, yeah, all yeah. of them. But they just, in, I think the big thing for me is that how massive Vietnam looms over it. I think we were talking earlier. I think David Halliwell, the writer, said that this is one of the most important Vietnam films ever made, and it doesn't show a single frame of Vietnam. Yeah. But it drives everything, really. Yeah, and we we talked before when, about things like class, and I think that you know that it was because having not seen it in a long time and sort of knowing about Milius and the perception of Milius as a very right wing, very kind of militaristic kind of pers- personality as a director and as a kind of person, you kind of ex- I was kind of expecting it to be much more simple about America's involvement in in Vietnam, but it's not. It's a really complex film about who goes and who gets picked and how they get picked and, you know, who fights ultimately, you know, which is a really interesting. And I think that throughout the film, there is those complexities of someone who is, is not, there's not a simple position on it, despite him being way further to the right than everyone else at that, at that kind of period. But it is, it really is a powerful, you know, kind of film about almost, yeah. And you've said, you know, the before and the after like America, Although the, those communities in America, where most of the people who fought were plucked from, working class, you know, uh, communities, blue collar, um, and afterwards, mm. and the legacy of, of of what it did to those communities and what happened to those communities that were radically changed culturally, while most of the people who lived there originally, and this happened all across America, were off fighting, mm. and there's a real kind of that you can feel his tension about that, and it's a nostalgic film, yeah, but in a kind of in a way that nostalgia is not a warm and fuzzy thing. It's a kind of, it's a, it's a haunting and complex and, and very melancholy thing. Well, and also it's surfing culture, you know, and that it got turned into a brand mm. and the brand was um, a sort of hippie, soft kind of brand, you know, it's what yeah. we have, the, you know, the, the idea of like the, the easygoing surf dude, you know, and what Milia said was it's it was that was nonsense. Yeah. You know, they were they they were kind of anti hippie because they thought the hippies were taking shortcuts because mm. the hippies could solve everything with drugs and and everything was free. And he was saying it wasn't free; everything had consequences, and yeah. you had to eventually take responsibility for your actions and things like that. And he said they weren't peaceniks; they didn't want to go to Vietnam. But if 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 Malibu had been invaded, they would have been on the front line. Yeah. You know, they would have well, they yeah. would have been the first to pick up guns. Yeah, yeah, As you can see in that in the approach to violence in the film. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And those two brilliant scenes which are right next to each other mm. where you've got the 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 Barlow home house party. Yeah. The all time hooter where um the fighting's like a comic strip, like yeah. a cartoon. There's not a single bit of blood, which I think is why the watermelon's there. Because you've yeah, got to yeah. at least have a bit of red in every scene. Yeah. And then they go to Mexico. And then there's proper violence when they go out down there. And it's like... And it, it, it kind of... It, it, it's, a, it's a foreshadowing of Vietnam, isn't it? In the sense of, like, these people are leaving home. And they're, you know, almost trying to take home with them. You know, their attitude when they arrive is kind of like that. It, it's the, and it's not the same. It's a different place with a different set of like consequences. But also, you can't. And that was that whole period, wasn't it? So it's and we talked about him off 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 mic as a screenwriter. And the the, the 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 building blocks of narrative are really really interesting in terms of how he puts it together to to build to that finale where it's it's kind of really euphoric, but you can't help but feel so many complex feelings about how you've ended up there. It's really smart. Yeah. And I've and as we spoke earlier, I've got I've got a slight problem with the end of the film. Um and I don't know whether it is because it's the end of the film and I want the film to go on forever yeah. or whether it I, I I I didn't watching it on the big screen and and hearing the sound design and the how brilliant the way the music and the and the sound of the sea work together. It it was quite epic, but I've always found it slightly anticlimactic the end that he that he rides this wave and then you're kind of you're sort of meant to believe that he's gonna drown yeah but he's never it's Malibu he's not gonna yeah it's, it's not gonna happen and, and it looks like Leroy and Jack are gonna save him but all they do is kind of help him stand up and there's I think there's um 
I think there's a, a better ending mm. there. Which, you know, would you like to share your better ending for Bill? <laughs> <laughs> By the way, John. Um, well, it's not, I don't, because it sounds really obnoxious, but actually there's a book, the Big Wednesday book, which is the third incarnation of a book that's come out of this film, because it started with um, Denny Arberg, who wrote it with John Milius, who is, who's in the film, who plays um, Slick, who's the, the drug dealer at the end who is the younger brother of Kemp Arberg, who is the character that William Catt is based on, Jack Barlow. It's all quite yeah. complicated. But um, the, f the original idea from the film, as I understand it, came from a, a short piece that, um, that Denny wrote that then John Milius and him turned into the screenplay. And originally Milius wanted to write it as a novel, but then he was starting to write screenplay, so he wrote it as a screenplay. Then as soon as the film came came out, they tried to capitalise on the what they thought would be the success of the film by doing a novelization, a quick novelization that would be like an airport book, which didn't really do anything because the film flopped so badly. And then a couple of years ago, they went back to it and expanded the novelization. And the book has got a different ending. And the ending is more fitting to where the film's actually set because the, the film's set in Malibu, next to Malibu Pier. The, the film was shot two hours north at um, Point Conception, with a different pier, but they, which is nearby, but they didn't kind of write the pier into it. And the the thing with what it says in the book, the thing with Malibu is the danger is is not pulling out of the wave quick enough and ending up underneath the pier, and that's the danger, which I, in the book works much better because what happens at the end is Matt takes this wave, which he knows is going to be, you know, this is the big moment where he's finally surfing with his friends again, which is what he said is all he wanted to do, and he doesn't want to get off the wave. And there's a moment where he needs to pull out of the wave, but he doesn't, and he ends up under the pier, and then he's properly in trouble because that's a very dangerous situation to be in, even if the wave, you know, even if it's not a massive swell. Yeah. And as a metaphor, I think that works better as a as an ending because mm -hmm. it's about knowing when to get, when to pull out the wave, which is which is what, that ending is when he hands over Excalibur yeah, yeah. to the to the <laughs> to that amazing kid, <laughs> the fanboy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I think that works better if he's if he's had that realization that he that he um, you know he needs to stop not stop surfing, but it's it's he recognizes that it's not his priority, and this sort of happens but happens earlier than that when he's. When he's watching Liquid Dreams, yeah, and they and Lopez cuts back in, and all the crowd start whooping again, and he looks down at his daughter, and she's leaning on his shoulder, and it's like that's that's yeah. your yeah. that's got to be your responsibility now. That's got to be your focus is your family, but but he's not quite ready to do that. At the end of the film, he is ready to do that, and arguably he should have been doing that a long time ago. But that's the kind of flaw in the character that's so relatable yeah yeah particularly and i'm not yeah. claiming that as my ending that's in the book so okay. i think it'd be an incredibly obnoxious <laughs> thing for me to suggest a different ending but i think you know if they could have shot they could have shot at malibu yeah which they couldn't because even by 1978 malibu wasn't the malibu of 62 because the the freeway had been put through and it had all been opened up and the star burger was a pile of rubble and all of that and i think that's the thing as well you that the the footage that they've got at the end suggests that that's what they got, you know, like, and obviously the film took a long time, went over budget, but you are ultimately out there shooting, shooting the sea, you know? Well, yeah. Well, the endings took five weeks to shoot, yeah. shot in the North Shore in yeah. Hawaii in, um, at Sunset and Waimea. Yeah. So you can sort of see that that's what they've got. So they're trying to cut together probably a huge amount of footage from that period. Yeah. into something that resembles the ending on the page. But they do hint, when it says Big Wednesday, you know, when it when it's that, when we go into that, the kind of the final act, it opens with two, it's actually the same shot repeated of the wave breaking under the legs of the pier. Mm. So it almost sets up this idea that the pier is the kind of, yeah. you know, the mouth of the shark in a way. Yeah. But then it never, we yeah. never see it again. Yeah. But, apart, it, but it is still a perfect film. It's still a perfect film before the riot kicks off. <laughs> um, does anybody want to share thoughts or anything, questions? Yeah, just, yeah. 
Um, yeah, I understand what you're saying there, but actually, if you take those three parts when he goes to the shop and he speaks to the bear and he doesn't like the responsibility that surfing, he just wants to surf with his friends. Then he goes to the, the cafe and watches the liquid dreams afterwards. And then he's sort of like a bit, he's a bit heartbroken that Jerry Lopez is taking over the kingdom that he once had. But in the end of the film, what he's doing is just saying, great, I don't have the responsibility anymore to have the kids looking up to me. I can pass that on, but I'll keep surfing. Um, and that's the kind of view that I've always taken with it. But Yeah, I, I think that, I think, I think that, I think that's right. I think, um, but I think if, if there's going to be a moment of peril for him, where his, where his life is kind of in danger, I think I think it works better if he's if through it's him sort of his recklessness rather than the way it is at the moment. And I'd argue it doesn't need that moment. He just need he just needs to go out and and kind of get the nod from Lopez, or you know, or be you know be out there and, and be out there with you know just be there with his friends. But it needs the Hollywood. It needs that Hollywood moment. It needs that moment of peril at the end. And it's called Big Wednesday. Yeah. So you need a big Wednesday. Yeah. So and you can you know it can't be called Long Wednesday, whereas you know it's just a really long ride. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Long Wednesdays are different. They are very yeah. Um. But that's interesting because I think that my reading of it was quite similar in terms of like, and I think knowing how, you know, dialogue driven a lot of the time Milius can be. Um, the film felt really loose and it feels, you know, it feels like there's a lot of stuff, particularly the Mexico stuff, particularly the early part of the film where you feel the, the, the film was made in those places. Um, you know, almost kind of, yeah, those characters are not improvising necessarily, but certainly building stuff and building sort of small moments, certainly in their, in their, in their physicality. And it kind of, it creates this really loose feel. And there is that moment where he's in the, the, the film and I think that you know if if you look at it as a film about you know masculinity and aging you know even if it's in a kind of very intense period which the surfing does you know because it's such a physical sport and you sort of said in terms of like where those kind of iconic peaks are you know he has to reckon with that in in, in a kind of in a, in a way that's not at sea which I think is really moving that he sees it on a screen rather than being out there and has to he has to accept in that moment and then there's it's a really quiet which is not a hollywood thing and i i, I completely see what you mean they're trying to inject a bit of because otherwise it just it slows down to him just kind of being this is who i am this is what i used to do but this is what i do now and that for me is a that's the kind of film i want to see mm. but if you're putting all that money in in 1978 that's not the way you can end the film um so i, I think that that tension certainly in the end um but yeah, it's. I kind of like that. It's almost almost like peril, but no peril. Yeah, but I haven't seen it ninety eight times. Maybe I'll feel differently when I do. Cool. Thank you so much. Who's next on there? Anyone else on there? Oh. Yeah. Um. Any idea why it was such a flop? Because the first time I've seen it on a big screen, it's really good, a big screen. Um, and is it anything to do with the year that it came out? I don't know. I, I think everybody thought it was going to be huge because it was 78. What happened was Spielberg, Lucas and Milius had three movies coming out at the same time, which was Star Wars, Close Encounters and Big Wednesday. And they agreed to swap percentage profit points. So they each swapped a point of profits. And so Spielberg and Lucas, who obviously knew a thing or two about not only filmmaking, but the film market, believed in it because they gave away a point from Star Wars and from Close Encounters, of which Milius did pretty well. <laughs> they didn't do very well <laughs> off him. So, yeah, I don't know. I mean, even apparently the time the sur surfers hated it, it was really badly received, apparently. Um, and then it took a long time to come out because of when it came out. It was, it, you know, it came out on videotape in like 84, 85 or something like that. So there was no... By then it was kind of dead, and then it's had this sort of cult status and and uh, reevaluation, and it's kind of amazing that it has been sort of 
reevaluated, considering that what a controversial figure Milius is, because yeah. it must be beyond the surfing community. So yeah, I don't know. I don't know why why it flopped. I mean, he got criticised for things like, um, you know, bad chemistry between the characters and stuff like that, and and just things that I just don't see at all. I just, and yeah, he got criticised for stilted dialogue and stuff, but. I don't think it's, you know. I think he's kind. Of, some of the dialogue is just totally masterful, and you know, we could we could easily do a quote along screening because there's so much of dialogue is so good. But it's that it, it, it's. I think the thing is from one of the things I was thinking because I was thinking about this when I was watching it is like it, it it's it's not any of those things on its own, you know. And I think that. Star Wars is a great example of a film that is it's it's one thing, you know, and that's where that is. Tell it, me about it. Yeah, it's just one big, one big <laughs> thing. But it's it you know tonally, you know, conceptually, it, it's very straightforward. Mm-hmm. And you know, Close Encounters is a kind of I think very different film. And Close Encounters is much closer to this in terms of portrayals of kind of like male mental health and kind of late seventies anxiety, um, for sure. But 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 again, it's kind of it's a much more coherent film in terms of how you feel as the narrative goes this is not that like there's so many funny lines and funny scenes and gary Busey's amazing but then in the next scene it's it's a really somber film you know and it shifts all over the place and it's almost and i think that it, it, it is a very different kind of film to what you think it's and i imagine that you know there's not a lot of surfing in it no there isn't you know and the surfing is deployed very very strategically in terms of symbolism and, and narrative but it's you know i think if and that's about marketing, isn't it? If you if you go in thinking this is a film where you're going to watch two hours of, it's not two hours of surfing. It's not two hours of quips and and party fights, you know. And like you say, there's this great almost kind of Animal House scene, you know, and then it's immediately undercut by this very very violent and very very horrible scene in Mexico. So it's like where where as an audience member, where do you sit? And I think now we're more comfortable sitting with all of those different tones and spaces in a way was, that... Yeah, I mean, that's probably it, wasn't it? It was probably, sur- it was probably marketed as a surf film. Yeah. So people who weren't interested in surfing didn't go and see it, and surfers went and saw it and were disappointed with it. Yeah. And a pro- I bet, imagine the trailer made, made it out to be this kind of light-hearted surfer party, you know. The beach. trailer's kind of amazing, yeah. but um, it's so epic. It's, it's, like a, it's like a Greek god yeah. kind of story which again maybe just turn people off of that it might be that well, yeah. good. i was thinking that when he deploys that big sentimental overture moment it's when jack goes to vietnam yeah there's that you know the music swells and it's you know that slow procession of friends like it has those moments but they're not they're not at the whole at sea you know, he's when he's before he goes he surfs on his own it's a beautiful sequence yeah. but he's just out there on his own he did say they were the mm. they're just those dialogue scenes are so hard to shoot yeah, when when you're at when you're on the water, <laughs> that that's why there's so few of them. Yeah, and there's the one at the end when Jack comes back, and which um, which has got the he was saying like it's they were they were chewing it and they, it was very hard to keep focus. And Milius was on a sat on a board, cameraman I think was in a boat. The sound unit was on like a little raft that would kind of you know float away <laughs> and stuff. And then they had the the surfing doubles were sat just behind the camera in case a set came in and then they would send them off and film them. And so he was talking about how difficult it was. And then, and then Denny Arberg comes in and surfs in on a wave in a one shot, comes in, surfs, pulls out of the wave, sits down on his board and, and delivers his dialogue. Yeah. And it's like, you know, that's just, that shot is amazing because it just shows how good it can be. But it's the one time that happens in the entire film that they get that. Yeah. So I think they, you know, that yeah, that's why there's so little of that stuff in the water. Interesting. Yeah, I, I just wanted to big up George Greenough, who did who did the filmography in the water. There, he was a genius on in you know in surf video and uh, photography, and he invented um, the great big water housings. And I think his housings for those cameras, he had them like for a sixteen mil film. So you can imagine how big that was to carry around with him. Um, and that's why they, yeah, that's why saying the focus was so difficult. They couldn't, you couldn't get on the lens with the waterproof housing. And he, he used to ride a blow-up mat on the waves, um, 
you know, everything he did was completely unusual, um, but also brilliant. But I thought the, 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 I, cause I do a bit of filming and, and photography in waves. And I thought that that footage, certainly for that time, it still, it would still stand up now. It'd still be interesting to see it in, a, you know, online on, on social media. Uh, and it stands up as as well as anything in Point Break, or those the Blue Juice films. <laughs> films up? Is there more than one? I didn't know. No, it's yeah, I, it, it's um, yeah, it's incredible. I was reading about it today about how they were kind of waiting for for him to sort of get washed in or 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 go over the falls because they they knew that they could all just surf while he reset himself so Milius would quickly paddle out and get a few waves while the camera was being reset. Anyone else want to? Oh yeah, go for it, yeah. The other great thing about Big Wednesday is that because we've all watched it over the years, when you're sort of a teenager, that first section of the movie is like, that's your world, isn't it? You watch that and the rest is sort of, it's there, but it doesn't really think. And as you get older, you, you pick different sections, you watch it like a hundred times. So as you're going through the different parts of your life, you're watching different parts and you, you're seeing different parts in the movie. So as a movie to watch sort of once, it's quite difficult to pick all that up and sort of love the movie. But if you're watching it over 30 years, you're watching it, you, you pick up all these different lines that actually you, you wouldn't pick up as thing or a movie like Close Encounters. You, you watch it once or twice and you sort of, the movie's there and it's, and it's done, where this you can come back to it and dip into it and say, oh, now I like that part of the movie and now I like this part of the movie. And now, I, like you say, you watch it a hundred times, but you're still seeing new things because you're growing with the same time as the movie's growing. It's like Matt's pool, pool service. He's got between, between, um, or a bit, between the North Swell section and the Great Swell section in the North Swell, Swell section, he's got, it says Matt's pool service on the side and it's quite a bazzed up car. And then by the time we get to the next section, when he goes to see um, Mrs. Barlow to apologize about the steam iron, he's, he's got a, a slightly more conservative car and it says Johnson's pool service. He's like rebranded himself as, as a, you know, he's, he's a little bit more, he's a little bit older and a little bit more conservative. Yeah, and it's all those subtle little changes. Yeah, because it, it, it is, yeah, you, you grow with the film, don't you? That's the thing. And as you said earlier to me when we were talking, like, it's it's a period film. You know, Milius is already looking backwards. And it's quite amazing to be able to project those feelings. But, you know, it's it was, yeah, it's late 70s, but he is looking very back directly at his own life in the early 60s. But he, and he was, the gen, he was slightly younger, so he was the generation sort of, slightly below these yeah. guys sort of like four so he was I think you know he's he, he's like the kids in the pier at the beginning when there's like got the the talking about the gun yeah he, he's that kind of age so he's yeah it was already a, a yeah. period piece. but that's what he's in you know he's looking back and how he's changed mm -hmm. and how that whole thing has changed which yeah if you watch it over over a period of time which is one of the great things about about cinema isn't it you know that and the rewatchability of certain films that they change as you change yeah. and your relationship to them changes if you go back um and a film that's so much about time and aging was is obviously going to do that do you know who's narrating it no i was trying to work that out it's um I thought you weren't going to tell me then no that's just <laughs> right i don't know no well it so there's a character played by robert england yeah who who went on to become freddy krueger this is when he was more chilled out when he was a surfer before he went on to to teenage murdering. Yep. And he was... It's it's him who narrates it, but I don't know whether he narrates it in character. Okay. Because it's his voice. It's Robert England's voice, but Robert England is in the film playing Fly. Yeah, Fly. Yeah. Um, But, it's, but it doesn't make sense that that character's narrating it because he's narrating it as a, as a kid. Hmm. And so I want it, it feels like it's one of the kids maybe who is at the pier with Bear the I first time. I wondered if that was, yeah. Who he, who he calls Denny, which is, ref, I presume, is referencing 
Denny Arberg, who is the writer. Yeah. But it's, yeah, it's, there's so much, because so many of the characters are based on real people, you know, because Matt Johnson's based on Lance Carson. Is that No Pants Lance? Yeah. And there's a, there's a poster on the wall in Bear's shop when they have No Pants Lance. Yeah, which is the name of the original story that yeah. Denny Arberg wrote, yeah, that yeah. got published, that Milius then picked up to write the novel, which became the screenplay. So it's, there's so many things that are, you know, some things that are real and some things that aren't real and some things that reference real people but the names have changed so in this so the original script in the original script matt is called lance and at the last minute they changed the character name um and then that character then goes to vietnam in apocalypse now mm. which milius wrote so yeah the person who's on the boat with willard in apocalypse now the only one of willard's group who survives is lance who is a surfer who's based on Lance Carson, who is Matt Johnson in this film, but in Big Wednesday, it's Waxer yeah. and Jack who go to Vietnam, but in Apocalypse Now, it's Matt that goes to Vietnam. And then, you know, and then and then it's the whole Charlie Don't Surf, Yeah, you know, when they're looking for the for that break in, in Vietnam. Mm. So it's there's so much... What I love about it is a bit of a... It's a bit of a sort of mystery to unpick who's who and what's referencing what things that are referenced that are real and things that aren't real yeah which i think it makes it endless the more you kind of learn about the backstory of it the more uh watchable it becomes and this book has got i mean this book was a bit controversial when it came out because a lot of people who love the film read the book and there's loads of backstory about the characters and what happens and, and there's a whole thing that when jack comes back from vietnam and he goes to um he goes to see God, I forgot her name. Sally. Thank you. Can you edit that out? Yeah, sure. Um, when he goes to see Sally. Oh, look at you, you pro. Like, he, um, keeping it in, keeping it all in. <laughs> there's a whole new, there's a whole bit where she comes and visits him and, and, and Jack's got a, a little beach house, which is the house that Matt and PG move into after Jack moves out and moves inland to become a forest ranger. And actually, Sally comes and visits Jack, and they have a little fling to sort of say goodbye to each yeah. other and all that kind of stuff. And people were, people were kind of a bit like, "Oh, I don't want to know all of this backstory stuff." But I was, because I'm such a geek, I just love all of that stuff. So I was able to find out. Like, I, I went on Google Maps and you know found out where the Barlow House. I found the Barlow House where they filmed the out, the party exteriors. Has it gone yet? No. Whoa. Well, yes. Yeah, this is one of the films where I that I have done a a, a pilgrimage. So I went to uh, I went to Malibu and um, couldn't find it, <laughs> and then went for America and couldn't find it anywhere. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I went. To, uh, yeah, I went to. Mal I, li I literally went to the point at Malibu and thought, well, this can't be it because yeah. it was just like absolutely flat and and um, but I was there in the afternoon, you know. So that's what it's like, and it was a very flat day. And then I, I, we were, we were just about to leave, and I'd been shooting Super Eight film, and trying to find the locations, and we were just about to leave, and I'd, I had a few feet left on the roll of film, so I said to Chris, the guy I was with, who was driving, I said, I'm just going to jump out of the car and run down these steps and just film. And as I looked through the viewfinder, I thought, oh, this looks really familiar. I turned around, and there was the wall mm. behind me, yeah. the, not the wall in the film, it was rebuilt. Um, but yeah, so I have been there. But I found the Barlow House in, which is in Pacific Palisades, and it was just interesting, kind of, because then you kind of know what kind. So, so Jack's obviously from a slightly more middle class family because of where the house is yeah. and all that kind of stuff, and it all sort of kind of makes, yeah, it all starts to make sense. And I, the book is a is a real, um, it's a real kind of um, treasure map of, of of the subtext and the backstory of the film. Cool. All right, we'll take one more at the back and then head off into the night, I think. Did you have one? Did you want to? Well, well, we'll have two more. And then we'll head off into the night. Could we just talk a little bit about Bear and um, Mrs. Barlow? Because they're the two main adults with all these kids. And oh, they're not kids, are they? But I was fascinated by Miss, definitely by Bear's character because he suddenly gets married. He's a surfing genius. He gets married and then it all falls apart. And this, the relationship with alcohol and things like that—it's a—it's a fascinating 
how the adults are portrayed. Bear was in um, Korea. I thought that. So he's a career. He's a he's a bear. Um, which I think you hear them talking about. Uh, where Barlow talks about saying he thought a lot about Bear when he was in Vietnam because they obviously knew that Bear's. Um, and he, yeah, and I think Waxer was in the same regiment as Bear. I think that's mentioned as well. Um, and then Jack goes on to sort of. He then does Bear's dialogue when they're walking through the cemetery. He says, I think it's about time I move, move inland, pay taxes, the whole lot, which is exactly what Bear says when the, when the peers condemned. So, and I think the story, I don't know where I heard this, where I read it, but the story with Bear was that the backstory is that he got in Korea, he got sort of isolated and had to sort of survive on his own and, and almost froze to death and he kind of made a promise to himself that he'd he'd done his um he'd paid his debt to society by going there and he never wanted to be cold again so he decided he was going to just live on the beach and and surf but then he you know falls into the traps of success and and uh capitalism and all that kind of stuff so it's sort of like a it's kind of a metaphor for the whole surf brand really in some ways and then mrs barlow i think that's barbara hale who plays mm. um She's great which is william Cat's real mum that's, that's his actual real mum i think it's her last film role as well um but she's great you know and, and also um is it they mrs mrs starburger yeah you know, she's amazing yeah she's at the she's at bear's wedding as well so it's like she's not just she sort of loves these these people she's a very she's a very kind of traditional character that you see in 70s american stuff isn't it that kind of like the matriarch who kind of like keeps them in line um pr pretends to be like you know ruffled all the time but actually kind of finds, she's their know. mum at the beach because yeah, yeah. their life at the beach is sort of set up to be so separate mm -hmm. so when when wax is um when wax's funeral happens and Matt goes to the funeral and he goes over to Wax's dad and says, Wax was one of my best friends. And he says, straight away, he says, D did you know Jim? You know, yeah. He doesn't call him Matt Wax. And he says, yeah, yeah, we were friends from the beach. And he just looks away and yeah. sort of, so that life on the beach is so separate to normal life. And that, and, and I think it's Lucy, is it Lucy, Mrs. Starburger, Lucy? I think it is, is um, she's that sort of, the, the, the adult at the beach. And it's interesting, isn't it? Because like, yeah, you're expecting when they say like, "Does your mum know about the party?" And he's, you know, you're expecting it to be that she's out of town or like, you know, she, you know, like she's going to come back and it's going to be trashed. And then you just see a, and it's again, it's like it, it change, it, 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 what's the word? Like, your expectations are not met, you know, by this character who is actually really, really caring mm. for all of them, but 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 for the, you know, understand almost understands that they are young people. But it's almost like the fantasy sequence of the film because mm. that's she's there upstairs she's upstairs reading catch 22 while the downstairs of her house is being physically destroyed yeah yeah and there's an amazing bit where jack comes in when the girls come in looking for the toilet and he sort of ushers them out and there's that great bit where one of one of their shoes must fall off here yeah. because you hear him say don't forget your shoe <laughs> and he's wearing a shirt that's the exact same pattern as her wallpaper <laughs> which is like a strange design yeah. choice because he could have ended up just as a floating head but it it's like you know there's a that's clearly just nostalgia you know that's how he remembered it that that the fight and the destruction was much bigger than it actually was and the mum's reaction was much more accepting than it actually was and um yeah because there's definitely i mean there's a definitely a missing scene which is the next morning when she comes downstairs that would have been quite interesting <laughs> well otherwise they just carry on the party as if the house hasn't been trashed by the the uh, the crashers yeah well it's beautiful isn't it because it has all it has all the stages it's like the map just the total reckless party then it's the fight and then it's like this the slow song yeah yeah the yeah. it's lovely yeah. and then the and then and then the uh the table claps yeah and then there's one down here at the front before we while the thing's coming down one of the things i wonder if the the scene at the at the the cemetery reminded me of the Big Lebowski, where they're paying tribute to Donny, you know, and they're like, "What do we say about this person?" And he's, he's trying, he's trying to find the language of the friendship through the surf. I just, I don't. Well, you know, the dude's based on John Milliers. 
Yes, which I thought was obviously that's where I thought that connection would be. Mm-hmm. You know, yeah, yeah. I've never watched the Big Lebowski. I've seen that maybe a hundred times. Um, so yeah. Okay, I was a sort of double question really. Um, I mean, surfing is not just a sport; it's sort of a cultural whole package. Um, so I don't personally, I don't think it would work with any other sport. You couldn't do it with American football or whatever. It's the whole culture and the location and that side of it which makes makes the film for me. Um, so do you think, taking that as well, that you need to have surfed or experienced surfing and that culture to fully appreciate the whole film? We talked about this before because I think that I, I don't, you know, I haven't surfed. Um, but I think it's about, one of the things about it is about subcultures and youth subcultures. You know, we talked a lot about quadrophenia and about how certain communities and cultures bring together people, you know, and it's they, it's an it's a form of expression for a certain time of your life that ultimately stays with you. You know, if, I'm sure the people here who love the movie and have seen it many times still surf, you know, in the same way that you go to places and you still see 50-year-old mods, 60-year-old mods, you know, it, it forms your identity and makes you feel a belonging and a sense of self that is universally translatable. If you've ever found yourself in a subculture that that has offered you that home, you know, and I think it is a film largely about home and the hippie thing is interesting in terms of what does it mean to be from a place or from a culture and then have it taken away, co-opted, and it's, it's complicated. So I don't think you need, I mean, I don't, I I access it through there and I can see that sense of like what it felt like which I, you know, I got into being a mod through Britpop at that time, you know, but, but Britpop for me was similar in terms of like, it brought me into contact with people who felt like my my kin, you know, and now 30 years on, our relationship has shifted and different, but there's still that power of the thing. And it's a very powerful film in terms of like these people, would would they be friends if it was not for this thing that has brought them together, you know, and there's subtle things that suggest no in terms of where they go and their backgrounds and things like that and that's a very almost a radical thing now in terms of it reminds you of a time where cultural political social differences could be put to the side because you had a shared love of something and a shared understanding of something that that brought people together yeah and in terms of the film i think i don't think you have to have any experience of surfing because ultimately it's a film that's beyond that subject matter but it's but if it's authentic people will go with it and i think there's an authenticity to the film because milius <clears throat> was a surfer and this these were his people you know he's he's in the film several times he's riding a quite a massive wave in the final sequence which he's very proud to point out in the director's commentary <laughs> on the dvd but it is his that you know is is his story um if it wasn't authentic, then then there would be a problem, and people might look might you might have to be a surfer to kind of be interested in it. But even if you were interested enough to watch it, if it wasn't authentic, then that audience would never go back to it again. So I think there's a true authenticity to it, and that's the same for all films. That's why you know Quadrophenia works because mm. it's authentic. You don't have to understand. You don't even have to understand half of what people are talking no. about you know there's there's sort of colloquialism colloquial colloquialisms colloquialisms can you edit that yep colloquialisms i won't but i can't <laughs> agree and there's terminology and stuff that people won't get but it doesn't matter because it's authentic so you 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 skip over the bits that are very specific but they are there to add to that authenticity so i think that's the main thing with any film is there's got to be an authenticity to it because we Audiences are far too sophisticated and clever and they'll sniff out something that's phony. You know, we might not be able to articulate why we don't like something, but nine times out of ten, nine times out of ten, it will be because it's been done for the wrong reasons, which will be normally making money. Whereas I I think Milius set out to make the film that he wanted to make and much to the anger of Spielberg and Lucas, that's exactly what he did. They did all right. They got over it. Um, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's a nice place to end.
Uh, thank you, everyone, for coming out. Um, thank you to the Film House for hosting. Thanks for Kingsley for running the uh, the phone around the room. And thanks to you all for celebrating Big Wednesday on Big Monday. And, oh, thanks, oh. and thanks to the cinematologist and Neil for um, asking me to, to pick a film because it's just been, I've just wanted to see this film on the big screen forever. And it's, it is so difficult to get it into a cinema. You know, it's just this film's so out of circulation. And it's crazy because it's just, you just imagine how many, if this is out of circulation, how many great films with, we just, that people aren't going to program. So, yeah, thanks for coming along. Yeah, thanks everyone. Well, after the audience had gone home and as they were locking up the film house, Mark and I stood outside and just reflected on the evening, which had been a really meaningful one for both of us in different ways. And I think, and I don't think I'm speaking out of turn, a really nice shared experience. And before I share the sign off from that evening, and Sandra from the podcast, I do want to thank Mark for being a, an amazing friend and also for supporting the podcast and for investing in the event and the recording and the evening as much as he did. But then I would expect nothing less. How was that for you? That was, yeah, that was great. It was um, just being bibbed by people that have... Oz Kingsley. Oz Kingsley. Yeah, yeah. Oh, has he got an electric car? He does, yeah. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, Changes every three years. Does it? It does, yeah. Well, because he hasn't worked out how to recharge it. Pretty much, it <laughs> just leaves it. <laughs> Let's go get it. Tow it back. Um, I thought it was great. I mean, it's always hard to tell what people think of the film but I think a lot of people who came along knew the film inside out it's always hard to tell what people think of the discussion afterwards but I was just uh, really pleased at how many people stuck around I don't yeah. know whether how you know I think sitting around and talking about a film after it's finished is becoming a bit more uh, usual but yeah. I don't know how many people who came along to watch a surf movie or what we think is a surf movie wouldn't We'll have been to a screening where we sit around and pontificate afterwards. So hopefully, hopefully we're uh, encouraging that in film culture. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think that was that was a nice thing. A lot of people stayed and listened and didn't seem to hate it in terms of the discussion. Um, but, but I think that the vibe was that people were just was the people sort of said as they were coming in and they're like just really grateful to be able to see it on a big screen. And you said it at the end in terms of it's such a nice experience to see something which is so beloved independently. Bye, see ya. Um, shown collectively. Yeah, I think that's the thing. You know, how many chances do you get to see a film like that on the big screen? And it just, I mean, I just kept thinking, oh, what other films could we do this with that yeah. I'd really desperately want to not, not sort of share with people as some sort of curator, but just films that I know have has got a cult following yeah. that would never be shown on the big screen unless... Unless you get the chance to, you know, like have this privileged opportunity you gave me to, to select a film and put it on the big screen. So I think there's definitely there's definitely room to do more of this. Yeah. And, I, and you know, it was a full house on a Monday night in New England, so yeah. it's great. So let's do some more. All right, thanks, buddy. More. Take care. Thank you. <laughs>